Great. Thanks so much, uh, Balaji, and to all the speakers in this session. It's been very, very, um, uh, very, very good. Uh, we have a facilitator for the next session, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, Zoe Juan. Yeah. I'm not sure if Hello, Erica. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, we that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, just found my <laughs> connection also. Again, I had, had some problem. Uh, so so uh, uh, in the first place, uh, I need to apologize if uh, there is any uh, uh, internet connection problem. Maybe uh, Erica is very kind to agree to step in. Uh, so uh, so um, uh, I, I, will, I will just uh, uh, act as a facilitator to move uh, the section uh, three. Uh, which is a policy methods and the indicators. Um, so uh, here, uh, I think uh, we have two speakers in this session. The first one is Fernando and the second one is Roman. Uh, I think uh, Fernando is here. Uh, 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 Fernando. Uh, yes, I'm here. here. Uh, hello, hello. Yes, hello, hello. yes, we can see you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, if you're ready, you can uh, do. Do you have any slides? If you're ready, yeah, yeah, just a few slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, well, thank yeah. you, thank you very much for the for the invitation to join this uh, celebration. Um, let me just find the slides. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> Just, I mean, the the the, the session three, uh, as I I was invited, and I said, oh, thank you. This is a few years since I joined, and I've been part of this network. Uh, I think since 2005. So people might think, uh, you just do the calculations. But you know, this is the the, the questions that we were given. Uh, I will try to address the questions, uh, not necessarily one by one, but just to have a conversation with you around the the issues, right? So the sort of methodologies, the policy oriented work. Uh, and some of the new metrics and methods uh, and sort of innovative methodologies. And uh, so the way I try to, to do this, uh, of course, is also combining a little bit of, you know, the, the few times that I do research, but also now that I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, working with policymakers and, you know, trying to to understand and, and to support some of the processes around, you know, policymaking and how the research can, can inform that. So, um, let me just uh, go and, and since we are talking about emerging technologies, uh, I, I wanted to give the voice to, to the technology itself, right? So I went to, I mean, many of you have maybe heard about the uh, chat GPT, right? And so I asked, I asked the, the chat, uh, what does it think about, you know, the new, the new technologies and policy oriented research? So maybe the, the first thing I got is a disclaimer. I'm, I have no personal opinion. I, 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 I am trained. So I'm giving you my, 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 my comment based on my exposure to the topics, which sounds a lot like the things that we do, and that's what we say, right? So uh, it's not my personal opinion, I've been trained on this. So uh, bear with me, as I think it's already a good start for this. What the guy said is uh, very familiar to us, no? So it is need to need interdisciplinarity. And I think many of the speakers before me that have been stressing this idea of, you know, the need for interdisciplinary work. Uh, collaboration is strong because many of these technologies are so new and so, uh, you know, cutting across many fields that we, it's very hard for us to really be able to understand everything that's happening. And then, you know, uh, policy making and empowerment, democratic processes, you know, this makes the stakeholder engagement. There's also things that I think uh, somehow uh, we need to also pay attention to sort of ethical considerations. I mean, Ben Toque and, and, and Rafi were already thinking about those issues. And then, of course, uh, in the world of policy making, uh, the, the, the thing at the time is uh, evidence based. But also in the realm of uh, these new, new technologies, it's, it's a lot of data, a lot of uh, data that needs to be processed on time. That, but also create some challenges, you know, the ethical considerations. And, you know, what do we do ahead? So I think, in, in a way, the, the, the guy, has no personal opinion, but has something an interesting opinion, and this is just the question that then I, I received. So, so just to, to go beyond that, so what do how do we make it uh, happen here? So then, in the way I think we see in the community, we have many people working in different areas, uh, and me and many of us are forced to to say, you know, what are the policy implications, particularly now, and it's not only uh, the idea of you, you want to policy, because you want to be relevant, and you want to work with beyond your academic field, so you also need to engage in conversations with policymakers. And so uh, what I think in the sort of the question is, what is the policymaker what need uh, uh, in terms of knowledge? What do they need to learn? What, how, how to act on the evidence? So one of the first things that we've been discussing a lot is about the technologies, right? So what does it 
make uh, the technology uh, an emerging technology. Uh, we have uh, heard about you know uh, digitalization, but of course I'm going to discuss a bit later on uh, biotechnology and um, nanotechnology in other areas. The important thing here is not just you know that these are technologies that improve certain areas, but you know they have pervasive, pervasive applications. Uh, the, you know we are talking about now the world of virtual systems that also have a, a connotation in, in in sort of physical systems. Terms, imagine Internet of Things, right? So now things are able to communicate. Uh, one another without the intervention of human beings, but also has economic implications in terms of creating new markets, new opportunities, new jobs, innovation, creating the value and, and being transformed that in sort of economic activities, but also just the way Rafi mentioned, and we have to have in mind the society, the societal aspects of this, right? The way we communicate and interact as human beings and the, and the, and the neutral system, right? So energy consumption and new materials, all those have implications on the environment and the way we, the technology enables those things. There's a development and dimension of the way uh, we understand these processes and how the, the policymakers need to act. I mean, we already started discussing around emerging inequalities or increasing inequalities. Some countries who have the technology, some companies who have access to the technology to develop the technology, another group of countries who are, you know, kind of in between, and a very large number of countries who are still really very much behind. Uh, so some of the questions for the policymakers and that we receive very often is, in this new context, um, can we actually leak from? Can we? How do we do? How do we apply these technologies in a way that enables us to to accelerate development? Um, <clears throat> but it, you know, the caveat here is not just about economic development. We need to be careful in understanding that is on the sustainability dimension here in terms of the environment, but also more and more because of the pandemic and the increasing amount of uh, you know disaster, natural disasters or conflict that we see, we also need to think about how these technologies or these processes uh, influence the, the ability of societies to be resilient, right? To, to avoid uh, losing years of efforts, efforts in just a few shocks. And then the policy strategies, and I'm gonna be a bit quicker because I mean, I have some more minutes, but you know, the idea is how do we transform all these in terms of policy actions? And we understanding that uh, several technologies mean trans transversal distribution of power. Many more uh, countries um, uh, or uh, institutes of the government would be involved in, you know, decision making, experimenting, and learning, uh, and you know the context specific. But something that you know, in a way, that this community has done in the past, and it also creates this link between all these areas is this notion of capabilities. And so, this idea, if we want to move ahead. And we want to improve on this, what kind of capabilities and you were discussing already, how, how do we build those? What is What do we need? How do we know what is needed? So let me just uh, move a little bit on this area. So we talk about technologies, and this is the work that we have done in uh, UNIDO for some of the industrial development reports in previous years. And the idea to identify these clusters of technologies, yes, we're talking about a lot of uh, digitalization, but you know, we know there's biotech, nanotech, new materials and other areas, uh, which have implications or applications beyond economy, right? Such society, communication, transportation. Uh, and, and we need to identify some so areas that are you know, the area of, uh, of industry and applications in the industry. And then if you go even further, further, you identify these ideas of uh, industry 4.0 or, you know, this smart factor. So this really, we need to understand how these technologies are applied in society, what the implications are, what are the conditions for them to be applied, but also understanding what is inside. And I think the discussion we had earlier means that, you know, we are not sort of uh, achieve a consensus of whether this is revolutionary or revolutionary, it's a cumulative process or it's a new paradigm. But it's a lot of interest in the policy uh, area to so understand how do we actually climb the ladder? Can we identify a ladder? What kind of indicators do we need? What kind of processes? How do we understand the, the different areas? Uh, and, and how do we actually uh, understand the, the processes that enable a, a, a very big base of companies or, or, or you know, entities to, to go into this idea of you know, the interconnected society? And so some of the work that have we've been doing at the level of firms, trying to understand how these technologies, <clears throat> and you see a lot of effort in terms of readiness indexes or how technologies get involved, what kind of uh, technologies are applied where, but the question remains is what kind of capabilities enable the, the absorption of those technologies. And so we tried to do some initial efforts in a paper we published in, with some colleagues in Canada and Malaysia, on research policy in terms of the idea that trying to understand from a, you know, based on a literature review, the kind of capabilities and how these different uh, technologies require different capabilities. And it's not an easy uh, way to capture because really there's uh, 
so in a way, when you try to see what people are doing on the more practical aspects, it's a long list of questions, long list of issues that, you know, that really, what does it make possible a, a, an interconnecting company? So those are these areas beyond, uh, you know, the usual aspects that we study in terms of production, we have to understand logistics and many other areas. So that's a set of indicators, a set of methodologies that needs to be developed. And it's a lot of work, but all, uh, you know, very difficult to integrate and to have in a single area. Uh, it becomes even more complicated when you try to understand how these technologies, how these, uh, you know, multi-purpose technologies are applied across sectors. You know, a similar technology, a 3D printer can be used for you know, mach machine tools uh, for aerospace or you know, different things. So how is this uh, uh, possible in terms of you know, how we can actually make comparison? If I'm a policymaker who right, would like to sort of support certain industries, identify uh, where am I good at, what are my potential, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges? Yet we need to understand really uh, across different areas of, of work. Uh, and, you know, uh, the work that uh, Professor Antonio Androni and uh, colleagues have been doing in terms of trying to understand how the we have to have some kind of foundational level of capabilities. So there is a minimal level of uh, things that we need to do in order to enable uh, companies or, or even countries to actually be able to, to absorb first, to eventually mobilize and eventually try to move more forward in terms of this technology. So really is uh, changing the basis and, and understanding, is there a such a base? I mean, that's a discussion maybe for the, for the community here to understand how does that base look like? And we've been trying to transform some of those things actually in, in areas where policymakers can make decisions. And, and, you know, looking at things like, you know, basic infrastructure, like digital uh, energy, and try to understand by apply, applying the concept that we know from uh, Bell and Pavid and other authors, uh, some of those uh, who are here today, no, in terms of, you know, production capabilities, innovation capabilities, and the really, really novelties. What does it mean to have a digital capabilities? How, how do we uh, capture in, in, in real terms? what is uh, meant by digital, right? So what are they, for example, if you think of an industry for import zero company or a, or a firm or, or a product, I mean, why? I mean, how do we capture this? And so using trade data, there's some, some efforts to actually uh, characterize these things, measure these things and see how these technologies are distributed across the world and does it make sense? Uh, can we capture other areas? And, and then of course, linking back to the idea of uh, capabilities, what do we need to actually be able to, to disinvolve it? So I think it's really, uh, an area where there's a lot of uh, impulse uh, and that we could also explore in this community. And also explore in the sense that uh, it's not only for academic purpose, but you know, policymakers are really try struggling to make decisions and they need evidence and they need guidance. Uh, and I think this community is also uh, you know, poised for that. So, and then, you know, as I say, like you know, many, many of these people are trying to get some guidance because, you know, we see this is an opportunity but we need to find a, a pathway as a trajectory. You know, we're talking about directionality and some <clears throat> and some uh, strategies. But beyond that, really, so I mean, in the end, can we can we produce a very nice document? But can we implement? Can we uh, understand the challenges that imply in for the, the context, the context, and, and the, the activities that are required? And so, what I think is an, in an area that also the community here in, uh, in the Globalix family can have is just uh, idea. I don't know some other. Places I've been asking the idea of so we we provide policy recommendation, but who are we talking about? We provide a policy, but who is the actor that is going to go and do something with that recommendation? I think some of the work that we've seen in the past, uh, you know, the importance of governance, the importance of governments, the importance of really having, uh, uh, you know, a regulatory frameworks uh, uh, that enable certain uh, uh, activities so that innovation can flourish. But really, so uh, if we talk about policy, when well, let's talk about the policy makers. I think something that it's an area of opportunity here for for many of the in the communities to actually start exploring a bit more on what does it mean in this technology technological change. Uh, what are the requirements for the policy makers? What are the kind of the needs in terms of knowledge, training, uh, opportunities for 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 the community to actually influence decision making at different levels? So, you know, and then here I think I I, I found very interesting uh, to learn from some of the work on the political economy and the political sciences or on management, no? in terms of, uh, you know, what kind of uh, individual, what kind of what dimension are, are we talking about, the, uh, sort of the individual, organizational, or the systemic level? How do we influence decision making in that area? And then we need political power, we need to operationalize things, or we need more ability to do analysis and, and, and deal with evidence. So really this sort of uh, 
complexity of things that the policymaker uh, at different levels needs to, to, to act on. And then I think that's also a very interesting area of research. It's all about innovation policy, yes, but who is the innovation policy maker? How the, the needs change and also how the technologies enable this. Um, and okay, so again, this, this idea of, you know, looking at, for example, we had a, a conversation once with a, some colleagues from Korea. You know, we always think about the Korean case as, you know, a, a emblematic or model of how uh, combining STI policy with neutral policy, but you know, somebody was behind the policy. So, so what is the, the characteristics of the policy maker that allowed Korea to actually do what, what, it, what they did uh, over time and how they were adjusting this? So this really idea of, as I mentioned, an, the analytical competences, operationalizing uh, the policies, but also, you know, negotiating and, and opening the spaces for them. So these ideas, I think, can be uh, potentially of interest for the community. And just also, just, just to finalize, and I think it's also a, a, an area where uh, this is something I've been trying to develop over the last year, but also the, because of the pandemic. We also saw uh, a lot of challenges in terms of, you know, what the ability of science technology innovation systems to respond to, to a, a very, uh, you know, uh, dramatic issue some, such as the pandemic. And, you know, we had, uh, how did the, company, the, the countries respond, the government or the institutions responsible to support STI for, or, or is, is responsible for the uh, innovation policy making? And they responded to whatever they had. So, but we, they also were uh, obliged to make decisions based on knowledge that was emerging very rapidly. But often they didn't have the tools or the ability to actually uh, uh, validate, right? So the peer review mechanism in itself was also put into challenging situation. Governments or the policymakers having to act on evidence was not substantiated, and the, the risk levels. So, again, this understanding of how uh, we transform some of these processes into actual policy making and, and how that translates into sort of the idea of uh, STI systems or innovation systems that are more agile, reliable, and relevant because that's an end. So really, really the idea here is to understand uh, how the community and how do we capture uh, research that enables uh, understanding of the processes that policymakers face in order to make decisions that enable innovation to achieve. Innovation is the, not the end in itself, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the way to uh, improving some sort of wealth in societies. And, and I think some of the issues that we've been talking here about regulation, about uh, inequalities, about um, uh, certain groups uh, monopolizing the, the, the capabilities is very important uh, moving forward. So I would just uh, put it like this. I know it's a very rush and combined, uh, very chaotic maybe way of uh, putting some of these ideas here, but the idea is just to hopefully have uh, some discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando, and uh, uh, thanks for the presentation uh, and also very, very important uh, questions for this uh, policy-oriented research on emerging technologies. Uh, and also, I like the the uh, you have uh, your attempt uh, uh, on the chat GPT that uh, 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 clarify the the uh, the new methodological uh, uh, towards our policy oriented approaches uh, in the research agenda. So that's uh, that's very very interesting. Um, so. Um, uh, we maybe maybe we move to the next uh, speaker first, and uh, then we invite our discussions, and uh, then we, uh, you, uh, we 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 uh, we have all the questions uh, to our speakers. Um, and then uh, next speaker uh, will be Roman. Yes. Uh, hello, Roman. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I hope you can hear me clear. Yes, uh, more or less. Yeah, yeah. It may be a bit noisy because I'm sitting uh, in an airport. I'm. Uh, yeah, this, it's a long story, but uh, I have uh, <laughs> one and a half hours until my next flight. And it's, uh, yeah, I asked Rasmus, why is it on a Sunday? He said, like, we're, you know, it's uh, people are busy and this and that. So, yeah, but I, it fits today very well for me. So I just uh, landed from France and I will go back uh, further. So anyway, I sit here in Copenhagen Airport and I hope there is enough light and the sound is more or less OK. Let me share my screen with you and uh, yeah. yeah for the presentation okay all okay. right yeah the screen i think uh, in the first place i think the the light is okay we can see you very clearly yes. and the voice okay. is, uh, is and perfect. you can see also the slides right mm. yeah very nice now, all right so uh yeah thank you very much for inviting me this is going to be a very practical talk i hope i you know um i will 
say a few words why it is so practical but the way how i read the questions was like basically do pretty much whatever you like but into the direction of uh, methods and uh, policy and communication so uh, policy methods and indicators and I, I will go into the direction of natural language processing that's what where I spent most of my time working so uh, a little bit about me um, I put some nice pictures from the past most of you know me I used to be in the secret global secretariat from 2012 until 2017 and here are some pictures from the conferences we had in Addis Ababa and Cuba and Indonesia with uh, Miranda so uh was you know good old times but uh for those that don't know me I have been very much in the community but then in the recent times uh uh I uh, have more of a more national industrial focus uh, I, I'm the project lead for AI Denmark which is one of the large uh, national initiatives for bringing AI technologies into small and middle-sized companies with an overall funding of around seven, eight million uh, euro. We are uh, now going to continue it as a framework program, maybe also as a governmental program. So that's the kind of stuff that I do recently. So I'm very much engaged on the one side on teaching, data science, AI, still doing uh, science technology mapping type of research. This is where I come from. But then on the other side, I work a lot uh, with industry. And uh, so some of my views are coming a little bit from this direction. So the place where I come from right now actually is uh, yesterday. It's uh, Cannes in France, a very nice place with uh, lots of sun, much more sun than Copenhagen, even though today it's not too bad. Um, and on this picture here, this is, you can see on the one hand, it's uh, Jan Lacoon that we had yesterday, who is the uh, science, uh, well, uh, vice president of uh, Meta, Facebook, and the science director there. And then on the other picture, the panel was uh, there were people uh, among others. Uh, so this the guy here, uh, third from the left, uh, he's basically the author on the paper, which is foundational for everything that we have right now in uh, state of the art artificial intelligence. He's the CEO of a company called Cohere. And the next to him, uh, the guy with the microphone is uh, the uh, science director of uh, Hugging Face, which is one of the fastest growing AI platform companies right now. And uh, so I'm going to stick like to some of these things, as I said, but basically when I hear them speak and when I also kind of reflect on my experiences, uh, I think we could get already very, very far if we just got, uh, you know, uh, company people and government people, you know, uh, just to take a basic statistics course, like really uh, statistics 101 university, just understand the very basic of this uh, rather abstract technology. Uh, and this is I'm uh, referring to artificial intelligence, just, you know, a basic statistics course, stop wasting time on really kind of, let's say, bullshit, uh, very high level, uh, lofty uh, words. Just take a statistics course because actually this technology is math and statistics and uh, a lot of the stuff that's happening in this technology we have uh, turnover times of one and a half weeks between it's coming out as a mathematical model from some university to it being implemented in production so and that makes also uh, policy and regulation extremely complicated as we now see with the generative models where the EU had to do like emergency meetings to get something and the AI act uh, as soon as uh, like uh, when we have seen with uh, when uh, uh, chat gpt came out as a one of like kind of the big generative technology that's just been inter introduced uh, to the to a mainstream public i mean the, these technologies have been around but uh, this has triggered uh, lots of discussion and uh, a lot of discussions that we had about you know data size and privacy and things I would say they're actually based on a slightly outdated paradigm of uh, supervised machine learning, but a bit more about that. However, what I want to talk is um, go somewhere else. It's about methods. So, and here, uh, shameless self-promotion that just came out a few weeks ago, uh, a collaboration between uh, our lovely facilitator, Zhou Yang right now, myself and uh, Sung Julie in Korea and uh, Daniel Hein, my colleague here in Olbo. It's a special issue in Scientometrics on machine learning and artificial intelligence for science, technology, innovation, mapping, and forecasting. So we have a very nice collection of papers here that actually review uh, the state of the art of these techniques. Um, so that's uh, you can look into that. What I would like to talk about today uh, would be, however, um, you know, I'd like to split it up a little bit. So I'd like to talk on the one hand about, you know, what can we do actually with language processing? Because this is the year right now of language processing, at least since ChatGPT, these technologies really now coming through. And I'm very happy about it. Uh, and, um, you know, just like give you an overview, what is actually happening right now there? 
uh, and what can we do in terms of using these methods. On the other hand, side, I'd like to present some cases where we actually applied it in research. So um, when we look at, uh, you know, what can you do with NLP, natural language processing, uh, uh, these techniques, there's three things. So one is uh, text classification or regression. So you can, you know, text, take text and say it's positive or negative, it's fake news, it's real. Uh, which technology class is it? Like, for example, patent uh, classification and things like this. So this would be classification or regression exercises on a text level. Then we have token classification. You know, you do, can do, well, a typo here, but things like named entity recognition, spam detection. You can uh, take a text and figure out, you know, which persons are mentioned, which techniques are mentioned, and uh, work on token level. So that means on individual terms. And then you have, like, unsupervised methods for topic modeling. Like, you know, you have a collection of 1,000 documents. Tell me which themes are more or less treated. And then, you know, uh, there is the three and a half, I say it's vectorization in general, you can create embeddings. So that means you can create representation of a text that's machine readable and then do things like semantic search or distance measuring to figure out, you know, how far are things from each other, what is similar to what, and leverage this method to say, for example, which technology is similar to which publication. Things like that. So this is kind of the basic th uh, things, and I'm not here. That does not really include generative artificial intelligence, which ChatGPT would be. So to do this, two problems. On the one hand, there is a love-hate relationship between these techniques and computa uh, computational technique and established quantitative methods that we are so used to, like econometrics. I think there is an epistemic problem there uh, because uh, they kind of challenge a lot of the things that we do in econometrics and um, uh, quantitative people don't really like that to be challenged on the prevalence of linear models that they love and love. Uh, so I would actually argue for engaging more with qualitative uh, researchers and these computational techniques. Uh, and then uh, a bit of uh, developments here. Uh, on the one hand, you know, it always we always said you need a lot of comput computer science skills you don't need this anymore, especially in the last couple of years. The more these things have matured and become more complex, the more they become packaged and modularized. So that actually when you go to ChatGPT right now, you use the state of the art model ever in a very user friendly uh, interface. That you, So you don't need to do these things. And this is also true for other things I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Um, and then there was this always this kind of idea about large amounts of data. I would argue you don't need this anymore either, at least not for research purposes, because we have gotten something that's called transfer learning. And that uh, makes it also a little, a little bit obsolete that you have to have vast amounts of data to actually do something meaningful. However, you do need high quality data to do anything you need. So uh, this is a slide about, you know, just the general technological development. The guy on the picture is the, he has the funny name of a uh, chief evangelist. This is like his work title and of Hugging Face. And he, uh, we got, I mean, uh, transformer models. And the tw 2022 has been the year where these transformer models have been taking over everything. So a lot of the old stuff that's been around the neural networks, deep learning is being kind of now eaten up by transformer models, which leverage this power of vastly pre-trained models, including a lot of knowledge that you can then build on top. And the pre-training is performed by large companies and this is i think now the problem because we don't know what what they put in so what we see right now is a situation where we have a lot of pre-trained models a lot of infrastructure being built by large organizations like facebook like uh, google and so on they put it out there it becomes a, pub a public good but we are not really sure what how they build it but we can use it so, and, and this is, I think, where uh, I, I see uh, the challenge, not so much that they own the technology because they bring it out for free, uh, but it, it's not so much that, but it's about like, how did they build it and uh, who owns the infrastructure to run it? Because, uh, you know, on a small scale for research purposes, you can do it yourself on your MacBook by now. On a large scale, it's a different question. Um, so now, now a bit of practical application. I'm uh, at all like I'm going to show you some techniques that can be done, and this is this is like to really to exemplify what is possible today. So uh, this is what I've done actually while uh, sitting waiting for the other plane. I need I wanted to make a new example for you, and this is something that you can do, which is called zero shot classification. So that's those zero shot approaches. That means they don't need to be trained. This is a model called uh, a Facebook model called Bart Large MNLI. So the idea here is the following: you give it a text, and this is a text that I have from one of our papers. 
And then I gave it a few of potential categories. And then it just reads through the text and tells me, well, I think this text is about this category, about education. The text doesn't never mention education explicitly. It's just about, you know, ed tech technology stuff and like pedagogical approaches, but it reads it through. It understands the text. It tells me what it is possibly about. No training, no data needed to use that. That's already out there. And it works in multilingual settings. Um, sec second example, and this is a so-called uh, few shot technique. So you use these pre-trained models and you combine it to uh, do something similar like the other one. But you say, okay, let's say I have thousand different classes between which I would like the model to make a separation. And you get away with extremely good performance only with eight examples per class. You only need today five examples, eight examples. That's pretty much enough to kind of to, um, to nudge these very large comprehensive models to do what you want them to do. And this is where we are right now. So we are not need, do not need to have vast data. We don't need to build it. We just need to take what is there and then we need to nudge it. So there, for many applications, that's enough. Next thing is, um, and this is generative models. So uh, those are models out there right now where you can, so I use it uh, with a colleague right now for a data extraction. So for example, here is a interview extract of like a person asking uh, like why did you move from Ireland to the US and then it reads the text through and I ask it please tell me what is the reason for the migration of this person this is the context and it just out generates it says to make a better living so this works pretty much like chat GPT but it is a model that's open source that you can integrate in a research pipeline uh, and uh, leverage to do data extraction on very vast amounts of text so in our case we have around 2000 interviews that each are each half an hour long that are transcribed. And we would like to get uh, this data packed up into uh, quantitative uh, settings. So and, or here there is like, you know, what is it the, the collaborative go, uh, ration good? Yes, no. And then it says, no, it reads it through. And it means like, and, but I, I just uh, interact with it very kind of naturally. Uh, another thing inter that's been very hard so far, but it's not anymore, it's uh, data creation and data labeling, having high quality data. And actually you can today also use, deploy things like Argilla, that's relatively new as well, with active loops, where you can create a very qualitative data set, like high quality data set within hours on whatever you are interested in. And uh, those are uh, things that uh, came not so long ago, but it works really well. Now the, uh, I will close with some examples where we actually use the stuff. So I'm not only kind of being uh, the chief evangelist of uh, this kind of stuff, but actually uh, show what we do. So this is a paper uh, collaboration with my colleague, Daniel Hein and Maria Grazia Squacciarini from uh, UNESCO. We work here on uh, mapping uh, technologies related to neuroscience and neurotechnology to inform the uh, bioethics council uh, in terms of you know where is this technology going and the idea there was to identify which technologies and patents can be related to the various subdisciplines in neuroscience that we can then uh, get a more fu uh, functional definition of what is neurotechnology because it's a vast array of different tech and uh, what we do here is we take uh, 40,000 abstracts uh, from uh, neuroscience research that is quite clearly delineated on Scopus. We uh, create, um, uh, we extract uh, terms using an approach uh, which is uh, I call signer topic, but you can see the link in my slides. I will send it around. This is a model that I published uh, on Hugging Face and there is a demo. You can play with it and actually use it in your research. Um, and then from here, we create uh, automatic search terms, query all uh, patents in Patstat worldwide on 53 million patents. And then this gives us an opportunity to identify which patents belong to which uh, scientific fields uh, in this area. We pre-evaluate uh, the, uh, the science with experts to say, okay, which of these technologies are actually technologically, uh, of this research is technology relevant to uh, make these connections. And, you know, the, this is an uh, interactive app that we created for the researchers to help us to uh, co uh, categorize this. So here, I mean, it also identifies things like, you know, the um, uh, psychological and mental problems related to COVID-19. And you can see like how it peaks here. And so this is 2020, like the big yellow dot and then 2021, 22, no, 20, 2021 is the last year that we observed. 
uh, we also we then look at into it like to identify some you know signs over time waves and things like that we can uh, turn it into identifying which technologies are involved which pattern classes and but this is more like traditional pattern statistics stuff that you can then build on top uh, another paper that's maybe a bit more qualitative that's something done with uh, Primus Konda that just defended his PhD he was uh, Rasmus's PhD student and uh, my PhD student uh, Eskil Anderson this is a paper on uh, collaborations between uh, suppliers and large organizations in education technology adaptation and here we used it in a very qualitative setting so we had uh, long uh, 30 minutes interviews I think uh, four or five of them where he talked to companies that are trying to integrate technology into public organizations. And then, uh, again, what we could do with this type of NLP, AI tech, we got uh, automated transcription out of the box, completely free, works extremely well, both in English and Danish simultaneously, which is also quite rare because Danish is such a little language and uh, hard to work with. Um, and then we use these models to identify 28 different sentiments that are mentioned by the persons in the interviews on sentence level, and then create have extractive summarization on top. And what that gave us is things like that. So we could like, for example, for each participant, uh, for each interview, we could do things like say, okay, how much disapproval do they mention in their in the interview what is uh, you know the level of realization or support or irritation and then uh, you know you could start playing with these very nuanced uh, sentiment responses that you actually can also have ai produce for you um yeah and then the summarization techniques would allow us to create these excerpts and say okay please show me what are the instances where they express uh irritation and then it would actually go there and tell you it's that's is where they mentioned this. And it's a very nice for qualitative research. If you have a lot of long interviews, you can actually uh, create these kind of uh, things quite automatically. Um, so this is like a very practical thing. Last but not least, this is my last slide. Um, like, so now we have all this tech. So what? <laughs> this is fantastic. I think uh, what I see is needed is uh, on the one hand, right? with people that actually know to use this technology and people that know something about the policy realm let's say broadly so speaking or the innovation area uh, and uh, how to make this collaboration fun i mean we have run down one project running in oibo which is called machine and the idea there's like you know create nice networking events create uh, retreats just bring people together and so let them have fun so that it's not becoming this thing that there is like the policy person or the innovation researcher and then there is like some kind of sub supplier computer guy that has to do the boring work like it, it needs to be a bit more fun this is like the, on the practical side on the other side i say we would ne we need to rethink dissemination and communication uh, I mean, it's nice writing papers for research policy or centometrics or whatever, but uh, since I'm more engaged with industry and policy, I see, I mean, no one is reading that, sorry to say. Uh, I mean, yes, some people are reading it, the people that are close to the community and transition into policy from this community, but uh, I think it's uh, like in many times. It is important how, like, how to see how do we communicate it. One thing that can be done with these techniques is it's very easy to create uh, interactive demos. It's in, very, that are interactive and show them on a website. Today, it's actually very, very easy to do. And uh, this helped us also a lot. So this is an example, not from us, but you know, creating these kind of dashboards and these things and then showing it to in workshops to policymakers, let them play with this. I think it's been much more powerful than many times papers. Papers are great, but a lot of the stuff is kind of getting forgotten and as it actually goes past uh, policy people. And uh, that's a bit of a shame because we do a lot of great work. And if we want to make impact, maybe we should rethink the way how we communicate it. So that would be it for me. Again, apologies for the potential noise around me here. There's some like some a group of kids that just came. But uh... <clears throat> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roman. I think uh, uh, in the first place, uh, I think the, the voice is very clear. And uh, uh, we, we didn't really hear many voice, uh, many noise. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think this is a very important topic, and uh, uh, as uh, uh, Roman has listed, a series of uh, uh, important uh, uh, machine learning methodology, uh, including uh, na natural language processing, uh, which uh, uh, now I think uh, is uh, uh, become more and more important in the policy uh, and the innovation studies. 
uh, uh, for example, in our school uh, now, the students are uh, start to learning how to do programming uh, <laughs> uh, for 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 uh, uh, as as a public policy and management school. So so I I think uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, the techniques can be uh, are used are used for uh, policy analysis and. Uh, 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 I, I, I expect that uh, this will be also used in the policy applications uh, in, the, in the reality. Um, so let's uh, 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 let's invite uh, our discussant uh, Gabriela uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, to provide the comments and uh, and the suggestions. Hello. Okay. Yes, I am here. Uh, I am. Thanks a lot for the invitation to to comment these two presentation and also to be here to to see all of you. And I would like to congratulate all of us for the for the celebration of the twenty years of Globelix. Definitely, Globelix changed our vision of the future, the way that we uh, research, the way that we interact with different uh, colleagues uh, all over the world, the, the way we see at, at the south and at the north and at the connection between the south and the north. Well, uh, thanks for the presentation again. Uh, first, I'm going to, to, to say some words in relation to the presentation by Fernando. And we know the challenge of emerging or frontier technology is huge for different reasons that you mentioned, the pace, the speed of these uh, new technologies, uh, particularly some of, some of them like uh, artificial intellig intelligence that was uh, descri described by Roman. And also we, we can see here uh, uh, the challenge for indicators, because in the title of this se section, we have the, the policies and the policies strategies and the or models and the indicators, but still we don't know very well how to measure the, the process of adoption of, of this new technology when you look at the, the work by UNIDO or by UNTA, where there is an effort to, to, to measure the, the degree of adoption of the new technologies or the emerging technologies by all over the world, it is difficult to really see. Um, we can see the, the distribution of the countries. We can see the, 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 a new divide between the North and the South. Yes, but when you go at the country level, it is difficult to identify the, the level of uh, adoption and the degree of adoption by uh, the different industries or, or sector services sectors in the in the countries. So we there is a, a challenge, a, a huge challenge related to indicators that uh, we're able to measure this. No. And also, in the, there is a challenge for the policies, strategies, and tools to, I, I don't know if we can say, to reduce the already existing gap between the north and the south, but at least to accelerate a little bit the adoption in the south in order to uh, avoid the, an increase of, the, of this uh, gap, no? And, and in relation to this policy strategy, the, the point is how to move along the, la the ladder of digital digitalization and how much all the, all the firms, all the industry in each country have to move uh, quick along this ladder. Because uh, Fernando said, well, there is a problem in the capability, no? Because when you look at the at the uh, in a country and at the firm level, the problem is that you need different type of capabilities in order to adopt the to adopt the this uh, frontier technology. But uh, yes, and we know and we have uh, studied a lot the the creation and the development of uh, capabilities and then the 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 um, Pavit and Bell uh, taxonomy that, that we know very well and now we need different type of capabilities in terms of the digital the adoption of the digitalization inside the firm. No? But but when you look at the, in a country and we even within one industry, we have that 
the, the firms in an industry in a, in, inside the, a country, the industries and the firms are using in uh, uh, industry 1.0, industry 2.0, and you have firm with industry uh, 3.0, and some few that are trying to approach industry uh, 4.0. And we, when you think what type of, of policies we need, well, what we, need, we are looking for, we are looking uh, to have all the firms in all the industry, in each of the uh, developing and emerging economies working with industry 4.0, I am not so sure. We have heterogeneity within one country, within one industry in a country. But when, when you go and visit firms, you find that the firms has production lines using different type of industry. Yeah, in some we were we were interacting a, an auto part uh, firms in Mexico, which is connected to global value change. So in this uh, in this line of uh, of uh, production where it is co uh, strongly connected with global value change, they have they are moving to industry for. Point zero. But in other division of the same companies, which are not connected to global value change, they are using industry, I, I could say, industry 2.0, and they are moving slowly to the digitalization process. So the, the complex, the, the situation that we have in, in, in each country, in each industry, well, is complex. And definitely we need indicators, we need a diagnosis, and we, for that we need indicators to measure that. And we need to think in what type of policy is required, perhaps a combination of policy. And when Fernando said, in terms of the introduction of the of this emerging technology, it's not just a, a problem of the STI policy. We need definitely a combination between STI and industrial policy in order to uh, move in the in the direction of the adoption of this technology and as researchers we need to contribute to the diagnosis we need to propose indicators based on this diagnosis and we need to propose policy policy models yes and one question for Fernando. So what type of policy model are emerging? Because you mentioned three, three characteristics of these policy models, but if, from there, from Unido, that you have a more a broader este, view of what is going on. No? What type of policy model at the end are emerging if in developing countries, if they are emerging? What type of indicator on how far are we uh, to be able to measure what what is needed, because uh, sometimes uh, indicators uh, are designed indicator at the, at the global level, but they are difficult to be measured at at the local level. No, and in relation to Roman, because a show uh, said it is clear for for me what you presented, Roman, is what he, he said. No, show Joan Joseph. For me, it's not so clear <laughs> what you present. You know? it, it's much more difficult because for, for the analysis of this artificial intelligence, you need other base of knowledge to understand the different type of model that are being developed. No? But first, I think that it is extremely important the interaction with the companies and with the policy and the public policy leaders because we have to be there in the discussion of what is going on and what are the direction of this, uh, the introduction and the development of, the, of this technology, what are the, strate the strategies, action, implication for the emerging of the introduction of this uh, emerging uh, technology. No? So you mentioned the point of the, in, that the infrastructure that was built or is being built is a public good, no? And you say, well, it's a public good, anybody can access to that, no? But as you, Roman, said, but you need capabilities, the firm need specific capabilities, and the, the people, the person need special skills to, to use these uh, this, this databases, no? And then 
uh, I wonder how to combine the, the big data coming from the artificial intelligence with other sources of that data. Because yes, it's interesting to see and the motion and all these bases on the discourse and the content of the, because I, I, I do a lot of case study, you know, say, well, like I use some of this model to, for my, for the, for the, the transcription of my, of the interview, no? But we need a different mind to, to analyze this type of information because uh, I never uh, try to to look at these uh, uh, feelings of the of the people that I am interviewing. No? So it is you need to combine all this with with different type of data. No, and I wonder what are the implications for STI policy? What type of policy strategy and what type of instrument or or, or policies? No. Uh, that we, we can think, analyze, uh, make a diagnosis and try to uh, recommend to policymakers in this direction. See? Uh, well, and that's it. Thanks a lot for the two presentations. Thanks so much, Gabriela. I'm, uh, I'm stepping in because uh, Yuan seems to have uh, problems with his connection. So he asked me to step in and, and do the last bit of facilitation. Um, if the collection if the connection comes back, then then he can take back his role. So um, so uh, yes, thanks thanks for those comments. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, they are very rich and they are very specific questions to both Fernando and and Roman. Uh, but perhaps uh, I mean looking at time and, and understanding that we also have probably other comments from the from the floor. Uh, Gabriela, is, if it's okay, I will um, open it up for uh, other comments and inputs and then give the uh, the speakers uh, an opportunity to respond both to your comments and whatever comes from from the audience um uh, we have uh, miranda and uh, reiner's hands up miranda please go ahead thank you erica thank you very much uh, i i really enjoyed this discussion especially because i see roman here <laughs> hello <laughs> uh, uh, but I think I, I would like to address my, my comments uh, for Fernando. Thank you very much for excellent presentation. Fernando, um, you mentioned we, we've been discussing about uh, how to, to, to understand or uh, explore the industry 4.0. It's about uh, because of the uh, disruptions of ICT and um, how we use uh, ICT for innovation, uh, to uh, and then to alleviate uh, poverty, maybe, and also uh, for productivity and efficiency. But um, I would like to ask uh, uh, whether if uh, it is possible to explore more about the term of industry, industry 5.0, because I think this concept has been introduced by European Union, for example, and Japan. Uh, so maybe it can wrap up what um, Gabriela ha, ha, uh, has mentioned. Uh, whatever the, the 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 level of the industry, uh, we 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 have to put a vision of the industry that uh, the industry can serve for the society. So we we are not talking only about the 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 um, uh, efficiency or productivity, but how we can use them for the society, uh, back to the society, maybe not only the society, but also in Um So I think it will, um, it will change the, the way uh, we, we uh, 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 set up our, our business strategy, for example. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing I think, uh, I, I'm trying to catch up what Roman has been explaining because uh, but I think in in the in the term of the the spirit of industry five uh, five point zero, I think as long as all of the, your 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 uh, your explained methods, uh, if we, we we call it, uh, are user friendly. Uh, okay, so we will love it. So I think uh, maybe would you please explore more about the the possibility to to at your excellent presentations by the visions of Industry 5.0. Fernando, thank you. 
Okay, thanks, thanks, Miranda, for those uh, comments and, and concrete questions as well. Rainer, please. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Great to see all of you. And also thank you very much for the great presentations and discussions. Uh, one point I had, Miranda was uh, already mentioning the, the discussion about Industry 5.0, the, the, the idea of making Industry 4.0 more human-centric. And so my, my question would be, what, what does it mean with, with regard to methodologies? Uh, don't we need much more interdisciplinary research when also looking into the community who, who deals with this human-centric approach? The second question I have, uh, I think on, on one slide from, from Fernando at the very beginning, there was mentioned predictive modeling as, as one uh, a key challenge. And indeed, if, if you look, uh, as, as Gabriela showed, we need a need for more indicators, especially with regard to policy making, but we also need uh, ideas uh, how to assess the impact of our policies. How, how will these policies play out uh, in, in the medium term with regard to the gap of North and South and, and, and with regard to the impact? Now, now, now my methodological question linking these, these both issues, uh, we see with, in terms of, of a debate about key impact pathways, also a lot of debate about modeling. We, we see, however, the limitations as Roman uh, uh, put it, uh, the limitations of econometrics. So perhaps there is a need uh, for new kind of models which are much more nonlinear, perhaps using system dynamics. And my question would be, what, 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 what is the comment of the speakers on, on that uh, research direction? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rainer. Um, uh, Rasmus? Yes, uh, thank you. So. Um, I guess some, some big questions, I don't an, uh, expect to get uh, uh, very sort of hard and fast answers from, from the presenters, but nevertheless, I'm going to post them. So the, the first one uh, I was thinking uh, for Fernando that, I mean, the, the, the core point of departure for your presentation is this framework, um, uh, Sanjay Lal, Martin Bell, uh, Paolo Figueredo and, and others which has, of course, developed in the context of manufacturing industrialization. And I think capabilities by producers. Um, so basically, you know, around the, 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 the central idea that you need to upgrade the capabilities from production to innovation on, on the producer side in a manufacturing industrialization context. But is this kind of framework still appropriate in, in this day and age um, with severe limitations to manufacturing industrialization, although all of us would agree that this is still important, but basically uh, the sweep of this, uh, these technologies um, is, is uh, so great and it's, it's very much on the user side. So don't we need to think about also, uh, uh, you know, user capabilities and not just producer capabilities, because I think this is, uh, a very important um, uh, way that these technologies are going to transform the parts of the world that we are, are, are thinking about. Um, for, for Roman, now new technology is not as sort of uh, something that we study and how it influences the world, but uh, new technologies in terms of methods. Uh, and the first thing I was thinking was that, I mean, it, it, it's clear to me that we are really witnessing a kind of uh, a paradigm change, a, a revolution in terms of methods. And I think we as a community, we really have to endorse that uh, despite epistemic uh, battles as, as you were talking about. Um, but very concretely, don't we need as a community um, a PhD course? Don't we have to rethink how we do, for instance, uh, um, our academies, so something about you know, data science for, for innovation and development. Uh, and what would the curriculum be for, for such a course? I think we, we have to, to do something on this front. That's, that's very important. Now, then following up on that and, and connecting to some of the earlier discussions, the, the, the issue of course is, is can, can we do this? Uh, can we use these methodologies when we are studying the kinds of processes that we are talking about in the global south. We have heard about the, the, the monopolies and how they own the data. 
So all of that uh, uh, data is generated primarily in, in the global north. Uh, to the extent it's uh, generated in the global south, can we get access to that? And also, um, I mean, uh, a lot of these uh, kinds of data are not really uh, generated or accessible even in the global south. So I think we as a, as a community, we have to think about how can we use big data science? Uh, what are the options for uh, satellite data, uh, things like that? So um, it's, it, I guess it's a broad question, unfair question to you, Roman, how applicable are all of these things that you were talking about? So interesting. Um, but how can we use them? What are the constraints to use them and how can we overcome those constraints when we are thinking about uh, a global development? And, and lastly, uh, again, also uh, a difficult one to tackle, but to me, we as a community, we're thinking more about uh, transformations. So different pathways uh, of, of, of transformative change. Can we use some of these methodologies to, to model that? I mean, uh, I think uh, Rainer was also alluding to that. So types of agent-based and system-based uh, uh, modeling uh, to, to think about different pathways of development and how they can be modeled. And of course, how they can be, be influenced. Uh, but, but thanks for uh, very, two very great presentations. Thanks so much, Rasmus. I think you've also um, your questions also contribute to the previous section of the of the of this uh, um, workshop that was about future directions <laughs> of of research. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of um, input to take from from your questions into things that we need to 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 build up uh, in the network. Um, Bentoke, your hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, two uh, excellent uh, and extremely interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I have uh, a question about language. Uh, I think, Fernando, uh, you were refer using a lot uh, the terminology of uh, uh, science policy. And you were talking a lot about industry. Uh, 4.0. I think it's a question of language here because um, my feeling is that uh, when science policy in the traditional sense is a much too narrow uh, definition of the policy issues uh, 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 here. And I also think that some of the most important uh, uh, implications and applications of uh, the technologies we are discussing are not in uh, industry in a narrow sense. It's in uh, areas, perhaps we define education and health and, and uh, public participation in political processes and everything as uh, industry. But if we don't do that, I think we need to, to be aware that some of these concepts might uh, uh, be uh, uh, too, too narrow. I have one question to, to Roman. Uh, he's still waiting for his flight. And uh, I mean, uh, you know that uh, 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 Cecilia and myself, we wrote this quite critical analysis of the, the uh, digital uh, monopolies, etc., and their role in, in shaping the technology of the future. Um, and we also had this idea that big data might be a barrier. And, and, and you, you are uh, somewhat less worried about these things as I hear it. Uh, number one, you say uh, the technology is not too difficult to use. Number two, you don't uh, use big scale data. Mm -hmm. You just need uh, good quality data. And then you say there's one problem though. And that is that we do not really know how the tech monopolies uh, develop uh, these methods that we are uh, uh, expected to use and which you are very happy 
uh, to use. You actually are on the mission almost to say use more of that. So my question to you is, would you like to develop a little more on that? And, 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 and why is it a problem that we do not know how they develop these uh, uh, tools that we are expected to use? Thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, Bentoke, for those questions. Uh, I'll take uh, the last uh, question here from Michiko. Uh, before we open it up to the um, to the presenters and the discussant to 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 make the the, the responses and final remarks, Michiko. Hi, um, I would like to sort of ask you about uh, a lot of experimentation that are taking place nowadays in developing countries with regards to pilots, and then I was wondering whether these data has been or these data information has been made uh, to use for the policy. Making because that, uh, I do hear uh, from uh, various people working on the developing field, we do have a lot of experimentation, lots of pilot projects, but none of them really contribute to the policy making. And I, I think that there is a gap in the availability of information with the making it use of, um, and, and then and this experimentation, as I think, is meant to try to sort of uh, expand the boundary because that, uh, you need uh, certainly the, the, the policy that uh, need to agile, agile, agilely uh, adapt to the new technology in order to find the, the boundary of the, the re regulatory uh, boundaries or the, the possibility of a uh, business model that needs to uh, scale up. But uh, I was wondering whether these kind of uh, discussion have been made in the, uh, in the policy uh, ground. Uh, that's one. <laughs> issue maybe not directly related to the frontier technology but a lot more, more quite often uh, that application of the pilots and, uh, and experimentation are made on the emerging technologies uh, um, this is just my question thank you um thanks thanks michiko um i see gabriel do you want to make a quick point before we pass it on to gabriel what's your I'm, I'm not sure if you were trying to ask a question. Okay. Okay. I will be very brief because of the time. Um, for Fernando and Roman, uh, which is the place voice and agency of actors have? Uh, the second is which is the theoretical framework that is, which is the role of equilibrium failures, bound nationality, bounded mainly for, for Roman, the last one, is, is there an experimental policy in your paper? Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks, thanks for uh, for being being quick. Um, right, so uh, I think we'll. You have, a, <laughs> I think, an impossible an impossible task to address <laughs> a whole set of very difficult and and many questions. Each of you, so please be selective uh, in 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 your response. Just choose the ones that you want to address, and uh, and uh, we understand that you know some of them are are part of our our research agenda for the future. So. Uh, Roman, you have to leave very soon, so please go first. Yes, I have a flight to catch eventually, but there is still it's uh, still okay. So uh, no, first of all, very again, very nice to see you all. And uh, Miranda, we should eventually go to a yoga session together again. I'm still missing that, so that was uh, no. I, I mean, a lot. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, let me just uh, very quick uh, comments. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is a bit of an impossible session. Um, let me start with an example. There is two companies uh, in my project we have overall 120 companies in the project over three years and uh, one of the companies is called my defense they produce uh um they produce defense technologies uh, anti-drone uh, technologies that they sell right now a lot to ukraine and to sweden a uh, very interesting company and uh, in the last meeting with them uh their uh, 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 cto 
told me, well, you know, all of my people working there are PhDs in engineering. They hate AI. They hate industry 4.0. They hate all of this. If I come with this, they hate it and they don't want to do it. And it's, uh, it is unpredictable because it just doesn't fit their kind of epistemic way of seeing things as being very, you know, uh, deterministic rather than statistically somehow uh, run. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is kind of a very interesting thing because we have an organization that works on a very high technological level and, and still doesn't want to adopt certain types of technologies. On the other hand, we have a company that's roasting coffee. It's a large uh, coffee roaster here in Denmark, uh, supplying all major supermarkets. And they're very happy to integrate AI technology in supporting their supply chain. And, so, and you know, we worked with them and they understood it. And it's kind of, uh, uh, so it is, such an abstract technology that I still will argue yeah, you need to, I mean, if it's about this type of technology, you need to be very selective and you need to understand the abstract mecha mechanics of it. You need to spend time of that. Once you have it, then you can actually start thinking what is the concrete application. And the concrete application can be a militant million of different things that will have all their different problems. And that's why it's a, uh, a impossible task to measure it, to define it. It's a disaster. So in terms of, uh, I really like Bedoka's question on the data behind the models and why do I trust them here, but I don't trust them there. Uh, I think, there, um, yes, uh, totally uh, agree. So I think when we use these models for qualitative uh, tasks, like here is, I don't know, 100 texts, and please tell me if these paragraphs are talking about some kind of green technology, yes, no then I actually can trust them because I can check it myself. It's text, I can kind of determine it and I, I can uh, take samples and I can see how well it performs versus a qualitative evaluator in a research kind of uh, environment. Uh, you can check these for these things. And I think there it makes sense. On the other hand, and you're absolutely right, these large language models, they are built on a bunch of texts that may be biased, that may have sexist uh, issues, that may have racist issues, and there is a lot of issues with language, and we know that. And that's why I think a very interesting example that's been happening last year is a project called Big Science. It is run by the company Hugging Face, um, the, uh, which is now the major player in this area. And the project work like that where it was a uh, public-private partnership where basically the company went out and said we are going to build a large language model that is open access and open source and we will engage the public sector but we are going to orchestrate the process because we don't believe that the public sector is able to build technology and I believe truly in the kind of way of going forward of large companies uh, actually running the show but uh, uh, involving uh, public actors. And what they did is they had over uh, 1,071 researcher attached to the project from all kinds of areas that were looking into the data quality into specific languages, into specific issues. They had the French government involved that sponsored the infrastructure to run uh, the training processes. And it was a very successful project. And I think this these kind of uh, uh, types of projects and co-developments, I think this is the way forward. So not trying as uh, the government to build this infrastructure by actually let these large companies do it, but have them uh, involve uh, public actors and uh, the society at large. So, uh, but this is a major problem and it's still, uh, I, but I think, you know, it's still important for us to use these things. In terms of uh, Reiner's question on, uh, you know, econometrics, yes, no, uh, it's nothing against econometrics. I think it's still very valuable and useful, but there are causal machine learning uh, approaches that are being developed these days. Uh, there is graph theory based stuff that is kind of, you know, these kind of causal models uh, that are currently used and uh, people, especially in uh, medical applications, we see this more and more because there is a very great lead, uh, need for explainability, for causality that you can, uh, you need to document. And that's where a lot of uh, resources are invested right now to build these causal models because the machine learning models are inherently not causal. And this is why we do use silicon metrics because we want the causality. And that's like a whole other thing. But uh, in terms of how is it useful for this community, I think actually the qualitative approach is uh, much more interesting. And now with all the, these large language models and the way how powerful they have become, actually we can start using this uh, as more qualitative researchers uh, because we uh, qualitative researchers work through language, and these models can uh, basically increment. It's kind of like you know, and uh, extend what you can do with uh, uh, as a qualitative researcher. So suddenly, you know, you can not check only hundreds of documents; you can check five thousand documents. 
if you can collect them and make it on mass and really uh, say no it is like this because i i read it all and i had a computational helper for this th these things and you can build them and you can chain them and because of this language it doesn't have to be entirely precise that's the nice thing right if you work with a large panel data set in a quantitative setting it needs to be very precise the indices have to fit we need to find all the years for all the observations or something like this you really don't need to do that in a language setting because it's a, it's much softer but then you can kind of extend your uh uh workings in that and i think this could be an interesting way of uh structuring and phd course around because i think uh, uh we will not especially if i'm now thinking about some um universities that we collaborated with in Africa, we will not change their requirements to PhD students in terms of econometrics and statistics. It is as it is, it's a slow process of adaptation of new stuff. But uh, I think uh, enabling PhD students, for example, to use kind of to supercharge their qualitative analysis that could actually work quite well. Um, yes, experimental policy uh the last question Gabriel, i didn't really understand uh what you meant but if it's the paper with the unesco paper with the neuroscience what we do there it's really just the idea to make uh, have a functional definition what is neurotechnology and if we understand what these different technologies is uh, are the policies that are being developed actually targeting the right things because these technologies are so different and but are kind of collected under the same umbrella term currently so that's what we try to kind of pull apart in, uh, with these uh, computational methods. So I hope that answers that. Yes. Great. Thanks, Roman. Uh, you've, you've really tried and tackled the impossible. So <laughs> thanks for giving a, a, a chance to, to, to most of the questions that have been uh, posed. Um, in case we don't get to say goodbye to you, if you have to run in the next five minutes, thanks so much for your contribution. Um, but we'll move now to- uh, All good, all good. <laughs> we'll move now to Fernando. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I think there's. Uh, thank you very much for all those comments and and, and difficult questions. I mean, but I think that uh, I, I'm tempted to sort of shorten my answer like that. I could turn those back to to the community and see if we can have answers, right? But just to give you a, a bit of sense of um, uh, connected to what I offer, no, the sort of the idea, the technologies, the developmental aspects, and the policy strategies. There's one of the things when we talk about the industry 4.0, industry 5.0, uh, advanced manufacturing, and if you, I mean, Michiko might have uh, something to also share with us on the uh, society 5.0 in, in Japan, for example. So, I mean, there is a lot of um, uh, competition here, and also what Bentake was saying, you know, the, the, you know, the language. Uh, industry 4.0 in Germany uh, emerged as a, ter as a term that tried to, you know, com uh, to combine, you know, a, a digital uh, agenda for Germany with industrial development and the challenges that they saw in terms of competition and competitiveness, right? So we create a strategy that builds on the strengths. We have a very strong specialization in manufacturing of machinery and equipment, and we have an agenda trying to digitalize the economy. So how do we create something? And so, you know, in the context of the Hanover Messe and, and also the fact that uh, they were, Germany was uh, the rotational presidency of the G20, and then, you know, the Mr. Schwab in the in the World Economic Forum, Industry 4.0 became a slogan. So it became also a way to designate a strategy and in many other countries, if you go to the countries in the US or something, Industry 4.0 describes an industrialization strategy in a very specific context, which is Germany. Of course, many countries have been adopting the term and it's becoming very popular, but it's it's really a term, right? So uh, I've seen, for example, again, you talk about, if you see the you know Industry 4.5.0, it's a bit of the similar thing. Now the, the human center approach that also is very familiar to the Japanese definition of 5.0, where you have a more uh, comprehensive view, uh, just as uh, Aventoke mentioned, society, right? And, and yes, I think uh, I agree with you, Aventoke, sort of the way I'm, I'm saying, the, uh, addressing this, because in, in a way, the problem is uh, we need to have some kind of operational definitions, right? And, and ways to, to cut the slides uh, in a way that, you know, we know what we're talking about. And that took a lot of, of uh, time for us to really only, what do we mean by uh, this smart factory, not industry 4.0, you know, and we use the terms uh, interchangeably. So again, there's a lot of things that we need to, to discuss here uh, uh, and also becomes a bit of, as I said, learning from uh, political sciences. It also becomes an issue learning from sociology and communications and how some of these strategies 
become, uh, you know, you need to have some kind of messaging to anchor in society. And you see uh, the same happening, for example, in, you know, in China with, you know, uh, the strategies that eventually got in trouble with the US, Brazil, uh, things. So I, I, I just to sort of combine, and, and when, when you say, uh, what kind of strategies, Gabriela, also uh, along these lines, you see a lot of diversity. Some countries are building this on the notion of science, technology, and innovation. So the strategy around these advanced technologies, particularly the applications in, in manufacturing on some of the economic activities are linked to the science, technology, innovation organizations. In other cases, you can see that this is part of the industrialization strategy of the countries. And some other cases you see a lot of in South Africa and other countries, uh, like technology uh, focus strategies, right? So and, and strategy on AI, a strategy on, on 3D printing, and advanced manufacturing. So it really is a, it's a, it's a collection of things. Uh, and just to connect in the way, you know, Michiko, you see this piloting, I think uh, it's not just the piloting, it's also a, a bit of what I refer uh, to the idea of policy capacities. I mean, we've been working, I mean, we, with Vietnam, uh, with South Africa, with many countries where, you know, we have a strategy and we know this is coming, but we don't know how to go about it. So you have uh, the challenge. It was very clear for me when I went to Vietnam the first time, uh, we were all particular with at a workshop, uh, the Minister of Education uh, representatives came to us and say, uh, you know, the prime minister gave a directive, very clear, everybody has to do something. The problem is we don't even know where to start. What is the definition? What is the concept? What does it mean, right? How does it look like? So uh, in many of these pilots, uh, indeed, uh, there is no, as far as I remember, the only systematic effort to evaluate some of the progress uh, that I remember is in Germany and where they realized that many of these uh, processes were actually crowding out these small firms or these middle, middle uh, size firms. It was driven by large conglomerates and, and the technology was also being uh, you know, heavily concentrated. In developing countries, I don't see much of the, uh, uh, I mean, we, what I would say put it in a way, uh, it suffers from the same issues that we see, lack of monitoring, um, lack of uh, you know uh, capacity to implement, and certainly a very strong lack of uh, culture of evaluation. Uh, we've been also you know uh, pushing the idea that uh, these pilots need to be first of all designed in a way that you can uh, connect to the policy making processes. Some of these processes are actually driven by the private sector or locally. So, and, and with the government, sometimes uh, it's, uh, it's unable to really identify those. Right? So, just to say, uh, I think this is a very open field, uh, and we need to be, be, be conscious that some of this terminology is trying to really dissociate from some processes. And, and, and do something, I mean, and something new, uh, you know, uh, Rainer, you mentioned on the human center approach. We've been working with colleagues from ILO and tried to map. ILO launch in the typical UN way. We launch a slogan. We will do, uh, you know, human centered approaches to jobs. What does it mean? <laughs> Creating sort of these kind of things. It's, it's really, but you know, but the, the, the issue here is we already capture attention and we got the, the, the attention of people who we, we need to start creating what it is inside. So I, I would say it, it is a bit of, of that that we need to be aware of. Um, yes, I mean, we had this paper and you mentioned Erasmus on the you know capabilities approach. Uh, yes, it, it's a similar thing, it was really a challenge to, um, uh, identify what is it, what is new, and what is, uh, how we capture it. Uh, and that's why I said, I mean, this is a, a very initial step. Many people are trying to grapple with these questions on, you know, uh, how do we actually, are these categories that we have from the past still useful? What we did in the end on this paper is trying to update some of those concepts and try to find where do they fit? Uh, uh, and not just in the, in the way that you see a, a sort of be dominant in terms of, I mean, if you see adoption, then there is an underlying dimension of capabilities. We tried to say, no, no, let, let's see what is inside. And it was really, really hard to find. So, uh, and that's already, as, as I mentioned, in a setting that we more or less control manufacturing in certain areas of the company and with certain associations of technologies. Um, the moment you open up to the users, uh, then the, it's a very interesting question, but I think it's going to be, um, a challenging uh, task to sort of, uh, you know, 
uh, isolate what you really want to see. I think that's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting dimension, but also then draws back to issues of culture, right? And 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 I would even say uh, age, right? So I think there is a there is a, a gap between, for example, where people in Asia are more familiar and used to do like uh, that we could see in Europe or even in 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 in, in America, right? So the, how you interact with technology, how easy you consume. How easy, how easily you absorb the new technology? Uh, uh, that it's it's a distinction, uh, but also you know there's ca different capacities. I mean, like see, for some kids are really more intuitive. Maybe it's an empirical thing. I, I don't know. Uh, for us who are you know more on the way, we we will learn, we train. We still many of us at least I I still want to read on paper, not on the screen. But my 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 children are you know <laughs> more attuned for these things. So I mean, it's just maybe that's just more speculative thing. But I agree. Uh, this is an area where we have more questions than actual answers. Um, I, I, and that's why I propose it, that I mean, this is an area where the community might want to check. Even in the in the way we have been doing this work, uh, you, Erica, you've been part of some of the work with ONTAR. There's a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the way we define things, in the way we uh, collect the information. So we need really some uh, efforts to make methodologies a bit more standard, a bit more com uh, co consistent, so that we can really draw some of the some of the uh, the questions uh, more and uh, easier to answer. So, I think uh, how to move then? Yes, again, this issue of the capacity, the capabilities, and capacities. Uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's that's what I, what I would say. I, I guess I also don't didn't really quite capture your um, question, uh, Gabriel. Maybe when I mean, sort of the, the theoretical basis for some of these studies, I think that's still a lot in the making. I mean, some of the, the, the foundational basis of capabilities uh, that we are familiar with uh, are, are giving us some challenges to understand what is happening. And we need to revisit those. But just the way I was playing with the with the chat GPT, right? So the, also some uh, uh, need to understand uh, some of the complexities of these technologies from the technological aspects so that we can also inform uh, as economists or as uh, social scientists uh, some of the, the the frameworks that we are used to now use are, are they still valid are they still applicable for for some of the processes that I see, that we see so I think it's a, it's a, an interesting set of questions uh, and I was leaving that I, I would not really have a much more of a, to say other than uh, I would be happy to continue to know, to learn from the community what the kinds of answers for many of these questions. And thank you very much for the invitation and for the nice discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Fernando, for um, for uh, also aiming to uh, to address the, all the difficult questions posed to you. <laughs> uh, uh, many of them are, as you say, topics for us to take forward. Um, we have, uh, uh, Gabriela, um, uh, for the benefit of time, unless you have something burning that you that you want to share, um, your comments were very rich, so so we will 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 take all of them. Um, we uh, and and I want to thank everybody for uh, for staying for extra time, uh, particularly those for 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 whom it's quite late in the evening. Uh, so thanks so much for staying uh, this extra time. Um, Alex has got something to share with us. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, to give you the floor, Alex. El sonido está apagado. <laughs> now that we are complying uh, 20 years, I would like uh, very sincerely to thank uh, Ben Toki. It was a great initiative. He drove us and he has been a good leader. He is pushing us to become independent and you don't see leaders driving people to independence and uh, in, in, in other way, they drive them to, to be permanently dependent. I would like to, to thank also uh, Gabriela and uh, Susan being uh, from the original uh, GSB, 
I would like to, to thank uh, Rasmus, uh, Erika, and, uh, and well, so many people. This was not uh, a work of one building global X. We have to go on and do more. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, thanks for that uh, for that um, uh, for that note of appreciation. I think it's very important that we that we do that. Um, you know, in each in each of these events, I don't know about others, but it seems like we share a sentiment here that in each of these events, I I feel extremely proud of um, you know the variety uh, of knowledge and the wealth of knowledge that is in this. Uh, uh, in this in this network and how many members of the network are now sort of working so closely with government with multilateral organizations with industry which speaks is a testament to the to the impact of the work uh, that we're doing so he's extremely um, proud of 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 being part of this network of uh, of, of of this community um, and of course i think uh, uh, the, the the founders of this network are are there to 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 be extremely grateful for uh, especially as as we as we are in this uh, anniversary event um i'm not sure if kj is here with us uh, still but uh, but uh, but he has been uh, uh, remembering um that uh, that we you know all of these discussions and many more will will come back and and, and happen in this conference in kerala in, in october the call for papers is out so I hope uh, many of us or most of us are, are there uh, at the conference supporting uh, the network and supporting the, the 20 year anniversary. And um, um, and uh, yes, I think I think th thank you to all of us for for the great work that we are doing <laughs> and uh, and uh, and keeping, you know, keeping the compass always there. You know, how do we put all of this to the service of development uh, with issues around equality, sustainability? Uh, policy always in mind so so I think that is a that is a, always a, a great reminder I also would like to um to uh, uh, say a vote of thanks um to the organizers of this of these uh, events you know there's uh, uh, Susan Michiko Marina uh, Rasmus um uh, Andrew uh, and and the whole global scientific board who's been very involved in in making these events happen and obviously all the participants um, so I just wanted to say a vote of, of, of thanks um, uh, to those. Um, uh, Alex, uh, is there is there uh, anything else that you would like to share with us? Yes, I would like to mention also Rasmus. <laughs> okay, okay. I yeah. am very happy and uh, and uh, <laughs> touched by the the situation the friendship that we have developed, all that, you know, is not time for talking. Wonderful. Okay. It's time for feeling. Thank you. Well, if uh, if there's, if that is all uh, from all of us, uh, unless anybody has anything, any burning last I have. comments? I just want to say that there will be going to be another workshop on the 4th of March on environmental sustainability. And there's another one on inclusive innovation on 1st of April <laughs> for those of you who want to join. Great, great. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you everybody for still being here. Uh, it's been a fantastic event and um, have, a, have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>